this morning comes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through verse 16. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great in your, is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your goodness and glorify your Father in heaven. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we open our hearts to you now. We trust your timing. We trust, trust your presence and giftings as well. And we ask, Father, that this would be an intersection of hearts and truth, of real life scenarios and your word for our fellowship, and that your word would issue out freedom, conversion, and power in the lives of your church. May your people hunger for you. And this morning I pray with my brothers and sisters a blessing that you would pour into me the gift of preaching and that you would pour into your church a renewed desire for your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We begin today a new focus, an eight-week series called Red Letters. And it's the red letters that we find in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, known as the Sermon on the Mount. And this sermon series will get us all the way up to Lent, through Lent, and end the Sunday before Palm Sunday. God put this on my heart so that we can be prepared to celebrate Christ's entry into Jerusalem, to follow and witness his cross, and to share more richly in his resurrection on Easter morning. Now, this series is about the gospel that Jesus preached, and if you've noticed reading the Bible that every time Jesus preaches the gospel, it's not a gospel that says, if you act really good, God will be nice to you, or if you profess my name, then you don't have to go to hell, or something, it's, it's not scary and churchy. It's bigger than that. It's better than that. It's more demanding than that. The gospel that Jesus preached was the gospel of the kingdom of God. The good news that God has not left this world to its own devices, even though it seems like it sometimes. And even though there are many people arguing that either God's dead, God's not real, or God is not truly powerful. When you read and hear the words of Jesus Christ, he knocks all that out. His gospel is the basis of God being enthroned, 
the Father issuing forth a new way of life, a new existence, and ultimately a renewed creation where no evil, no strife, no death will be found on earth. And he will walk openly once again with his people. There will be no sun by day nor moon by night because God's glory will shine upon the earth. There will be no tribal warfare because we will look at each other and recognize our kindred nature, that we are brothers, we are sisters together. This is the kingdom that Jesus preached. And as I was approaching this series, I kept seeing these commercials on TV about, you know, visit Alamogordo or come visit Oklahoma, then there's a Native American doing one of these things, and then come visit Arkansas where you can get away, or come to Branson, Missouri. I kept seeing these, these, these great videos and commercials put together, but come to this distant, far-off country and come live here where everyone knows your name and, and, and you can relax here. And after seeing a bunch of these videos, God then threw me in the midst of this Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and it was like Jesus is also telling us one of these places. Imagine a world where you don't have to fend for yourself. Imagine a populace, a culture where it's more out of line for you to judge someone else's sin than to notice the log in your own eye. Imagine a place, a reality, where not only there are no adultery, but you're so madly driven by your love for your wife. Imagine a world where it's completely abnormal to hate people. Imagine a, imagine a world where people treat each other literally like family. And not just family, but royalty. Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount revealing the cultural details about the coming kingdom of God. And as we enter this series, it's important to note that Jesus did not preach a kingdom that can be built by humans. This is not created by men's agenda. I've heard way too many preaching in, in politics about let's go progress to the point that God's reign occurs on earth. That's scary, folks. God's kingdom is not built by might nor by strength, but by his spirit, says the Lord. The kingdom of God is also not uncovered by reducing bad things in this world. There's word on the street that goes around, if we can get, a, get rid of all racism, if we can get rid of all sexism, how many isms are there? Like 3,000? If we can get rid of all the isms, then the kingdom of God will just be here. No. The kingdom of God doesn't come by the process of elimination either. Racism and sexism, that's all bad stuff, but that's not what's going to produce God's kingdom. God's kingdom is God's, not ours. It's by His intervention in this world. He's the one that will bring the final blow. He's the one that instituted it. He's the one that let his son die on a cross for it. He's the one that called your name to populate it. It's God's kingdom. And you can walk in it, but you can't build it. Now normally when we enter a, a, a series of scriptures like the Sermon on the Mount, you'll either think two things. Number one, this is my standard of living and I'm going to work really hard to live this way. Or you look at it and say, this is too difficult for me so I'm not even going to try. There's a verse in here we'll read that says, be perfect therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. And you're like, well great. That counts me out and everyone I know. That's where you get the phrase, no perfect people allowed here. But what Jesus is saying is that this kingdom is something that's not built by you, not created by you, and also it's, it, it's created in such a way that by God's grace alone and by God's movement in your life, you can actually walk in it. You don't create it, but you're, you can inherit it. You can walk in it. And the only way you can walk in the kingdom of God in eternity and today, as you can inherit it today, is by the power of God's Holy Spirit. And that's where we begin. In staff meeting this week, I picked up uh, Matthew chapter 5 and started reading through the Beatitudes. And what you have here is the description of the, the uh, population of heaven. Who the people of heaven will be like. And if you want to inherit heaven today, if you want to walk in heaven today, this is you. You've got to be like this if, this is, if you're going to be in, in, walking in the Lord. 
And so I was in staff meeting going through all these little things, Sermon on the Mount, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, and I was trying to give interpretation to something I knew nothing about. You ever done that? Well, you know enough just to be dangerous. And instead of me having a proper understanding of the scripture, what the Lord did to me was give me a really weird week. You ever had a week where it felt like God was orchestrating everything? You see, what happened was, he declared months ago we would be preaching this text, and he also declared this week to let me walk through some difficult things so that I could stand up here and preach a better word. And so what I'm about to say I know has full effect on countless hearts in this room, and I ask you to receive it now. You see the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for the merciful, for the pure in heart, for the peacemakers, for the persecuted in righteousness. God is revealing in Jesus Christ, by his own word, a progression of life in the Holy Ghost. God's revealing by the Beatitudes a progression that occurs as God matures you in the Spirit. This week, I got to encounter what it means to mourn. Have you ever mourned before? I haven't. In fact, all the loss in my life has been more grateful than mourning. When my grandpa died, it was, I was so grateful that he got to go to heaven, I wasn't even sad. But this week, I got to en encounter the mourning of God. You see, right before staff meeting, somebody came into the church asking for money. Uh, that's not rare. Happens quite a bit. And he came in and he sat down and he asked the church for help financially. And, and he was turning his life around. And I looked at this person and I had preached, if you remember last week. I know you memorize everything I say. Uh, last week we talked about the, the Gospels and it encourages the church to go out and find our lost brothers and sisters in the poor particularly. So here I am on Tuesday morning and I felt like God was saying, hey, practice what you preach, man. So this man sitting in front of me and he's sharing a story and those spirits welling up in me and I look at him as a brother and I encounter him as a brother and I get really excited and I go into staff meeting and I even tell the staff, hey, I just met somebody who's, a, a, I think he's a family member to us and I'm so excited to see what God's going to do in his life. And after this meeting, I'm going to call him back and, and, and see what we can do to help. And I prayed about it after staff and thought about it and sat with the Lord. And the Lord was telling me, do not give this man any money. So I called him up and we talked and I told him, hey, I don't, uh, I don't have any money for you. I've not been released to invest the Lord's money into you. Uh, but I think there's something here. We need to meet. We need to talk. We need to be in contact together. You are a man of the Lord that you can be lifted up in a community where your life can be changed. You don't have to live paycheck to paycheck, addiction to addiction. You're a brother. Hello? He had hung up. You know? And so I was like, well, that happens. Fool me once, right? So I was going about my day... <clears throat> Five minutes later, the church phone rings, and I don't know if you know much about We've got a, a staff here that usually answers the phone. I happen to be the one next to the phone, and I picked it up. First Christian church, Paul Carpenter. Somehow, the man's phone dialed me. His wife was holding it, and they didn't realize it. And they're having a conversation about you, First Christian Church, and it wasn't nice. They also have a conversation about First Baptist Church and about St. Elizabeth. They had a conversation about our Lord, Jesus Christ, and our Father in Heaven. They had a conversation about their problems. And they were mocking the gospel. They were slandering Christ and me. And I just sat there for a minute thinking, Lord, what do you want me to do? Is this, is this uh, illegal, what I'm doing right now? You know, it's wrong. He said, I gave you this. Just listen. 
So I'm listening to this woman talk, and it was amazing to hear the arrogance of an unrepentant sinner. How the world revolves around them. I even heard her say how high they both were. And they were upset because they need to leave their motel to get out to go get a breath of fresh air. And they're, they're ticked off because the TV plays the same thing every day. A little different than the guy told me. Right? And I'm hearing this and I'm feeling this feeling I normally get when I preach. And it's right here in the, my stomach. And I'm feeling this weird new feeling that I've never felt before. And it didn't feel good. And the father started telling me, that's my grief. As I'm listening to this person tell her husband about these arrogant, horrible things about their response to the glory of God and God's providence in their life and care in their life and people are willing to help and they just laugh at it and blaspheme it. I am hurting right here. Not personally, because this happens all the time. We get, I get called Pharisee and names all the time when I don't help people, but this time it really hurt me. <clears throat> And then God told me to pray for this woman, and I prayed for this woman. He gave me words, and they weren't nice. Father, convert her or stop her now. End her or convert her. None of this. And the Lord was saying, that's what I'm feeling all the time. If you were to remove my spirit's patience with this world, with the grief I experience in the babies dying in Syria, if you were to remove my grief of evildoers in this world right now, I would snap my fingers and part of the world would be damned and part of the world would be saved and that would be it. He said, you just prayed what I've been wanting to say, said the father. And then he said, oh, no, no, no. After I said amen, on cue, that woman cackled for about 10 seconds. Creepy. And then I heard, hung, hang up, hung up. So I went about my day. <clears throat> After just teaching about these words that I did not know the meaning of at all, <clears throat> now I'm in grief and I'm still, I'm pretty dense. So I'm just walking around not understanding what God's doing to me. <clears throat> and I meet with a brother in the Lord and tell him that I'm feeling the Lord's grief today. I'm not grieved. Nothing bad has happened in my life, but I feel really bad inside. I feel like I just caught a spray off the ocean of God's grief. The horrible. And I was describing this, and my brother and the Lord started quoting some scripture that lent itself to say that I'm not crazy. This is true. And as he's talking, all of a sudden, my heart and mind fly over to Oklahoma City at the side of the federal building that was bombed. I'd gone there years before. And I'm standing, looking in my spirit at a statue. I don't know if you've seen it before. It's a statue of Jesus who's covering his face with his back turned to the bombing in grief. It's a depiction of God's grief. So I'm looking at this statue while my brother's talking. And I even ask, have you seen, you know what I'm talking about, you know the statue? And No, I don't. So I'm, I, I am in it right now, just experiencing God's grief. And I go home that evening and going about my day still feeling this pain, walking in it, getting used to it get our kids down for bed, turn on PBS, and there is a two-hour special about Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing. And I tell God, okay, I'm paying attention now. And I watch this deal, and I'm, and I'm experiencing the pain of God. It's about white supremacy and issues there, and then this complete hatred. They didn't care if it killed kids, babies. Blew up the side where the daycare was. I'm just feeling it all night, and I go to sleep, and I'm feeling I can't even talk about it. I, don't have any, I can't process what's going on, and I go through my day, and next thing I know, I come up to church, and, and I do a meditation thing with Marsha Weiss. We do Bible study, and this thing's still happening to me. I go to bed the next day, wake up, come up here to, to the fellowship to drop my kids off at the child care center, and someone has gone down the street and vandalized much of the street, including our flower pots out here. We got new flower pots. Well, they went down the street over by St. Paul's Episcopal Church and tore up that gazebo. You know that pretty gazebo? Right down here, they tore it up. I'm like, what's going on? And so on Friday, I come in and, and 
prepare these notes for a sermon, which I'm not preaching. I'm preaching something completely different right now. And I, I'm in my office, and, and Jonna comes to me and says, she's just broken in her heart. What's going on? And the Lord speaks to me that we need to go at 1130 this morning and just pray down the street. Walk down the street and walk in prayer. And we had some members and friends of the church show up. We gathered for fellowship and, and prayed and went down there and talked about the Lord and blessed that space, went over to St. Paul's Episcopal Church where they have this lovely courtyard with a tree and a cross and squirrels running everywhere. It was just a, it was a day of God showing us something cool. Now, the Bible says... That heaven is populated with people who wake up one day in the spirit and realize that while their bodies are well fed, their spirit is starving. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And so the first thing that's going to happen to you if you're hearing from the Lord the Lord's not real nice about it sometimes. So if the Lord comes in your life and he says something dramatic, the first thing that's going to happen to you is that he's making a decision to offend the part of you that you never offend in order to glorify the part of you you always offend. God is coming, and when he speaks a word into your life, it's an interruption into your life, and it actually offends your flesh, and it stops offending your spirit because your whole life you've gotten used to offending your spirit while feeding your flesh. And so the first thing that happens with the Word of God, with the kingdom of God in a person's life, that he will show up in a way that you're not ready for. He will slap you across the face in your flesh and yet give you life in your spirit. And you wake up. I'm, a, I'm at attention, Lord. I'm paying attention. I see the statue in Oklahoma City. I, I get it. Okay, I'm paying attention. Took me a while. Sorry. Some people are right there. It takes me about 48 hours. I'm good. And the next thing we see that happens, if you're in the Spirit, you are now vulnerable to experiencing the mourning that comes, the grief that comes with the things that betray God. You're personally affected. That's called conviction or repentance. You're convicted of your sins. You're convicted of the things in your life that cause God to grieve. You realize that in many ways you're no different than that husband and wife at that motel arrogantly rebelling against the Father. Thinking the world revolves around them. The Lord was showing me that those who mourn will be comforted. Those who are able to experience how your life grieves the Father, you will find comfort which leads you to being a meek person. In Greek, meek doesn't mean a doormat and beat up. It means someone who has complete control of themselves. They're not running around all emotional and being reactive or defensive. They're waiting for the word of the Lord. So you go from poor in spirit to mourning to meek, and a new thing erupts in you that would not be available if you were living by the flesh. And that is that your new hunger is not for food or for sex or for fame or for survival. Your new hunger is for the righteousness of the Father. That's why you live. That's why you roll. That's why you run. That's why you get up in the morning. You're now hungering for God to show up in someone's life. The greatest thing that could happen to you all week is that someone you know experiences the Lord. You hunger and thirst for God's ways and God's righteousness. The next thing it says, if you're hungering for righteous, after all these things have occurred for, in your life, then you will be blessed as a merciful person. In Greek, merciful actually means... Someone who is willing to stick to the conditions of God's covenant. It doesn't mean be nice. You don't run ahead of God. You don't go outside of God's order for your life. You live under God's order for your life. The next thing that happens, if you're hungering for righteousness and you're living a merciful life, you will become, and Scripture says, pure in heart. This is important. Your heart is the bible word for your soul. It's the control room of your life. It's the place from which you make every decision. From the abundance of the heart, 
The mouth speaks. We act. Before Jesus Christ intervenes in your life, your flesh is what influenced your heart. Your flesh fed your heart. Your heart fled your flesh and back and forth. Your heart gave justifications for the sins of your flesh. Well, I'm just a violent person, I guess. I'm just a drunk person, I guess. I'm just an evil person. Right? Your, your heart will give justifications for the life of your flesh. But when Jesus Christ intervenes in your life, he gives you a new piece of you, which is called your spirit. And when the spirit moves, the Holy Spirit moves through your spirit and starts moving in your heart, there is a war over your heart. And it doesn't tolerate flesh. Pure in heart means someone who has been whittled down and they're having such a moment with the Lord that their heart is completely full of His Spirit and no longer of their own agenda. When someone breaks your flower pots, the first thing you think isn't, how do we go get those guys? Let's build a posse. Let's check the cameras. Let's call the cops. If the Spirit's moving you, you might have a completely different relation, a different reaction to what happened in your life. Scripture says if you're pure in heart, if you're pure in heart, if the Spirit is what's in your heart, what will happen? You will see God. You will see God. The rest of the world is going to run around and be reactionary and defensive, and you will be one of the Holy Spirit people, a population person of the kingdom of God, living on earth, able to see and discern what is God doing. Pure in, pure in heart leads to being able to see God. Then the scriptures say, if you see God, then you'll recognize the one thing you've been authorized to make. Peacemakers. You can start making peace down your street. You can start making peace in your home. You can start making peace in your job. You can start making peace in your life. You can walk around as a person who's living in this fallen world, in this world fully grieving the Father, and you get to live as a kingdom person, available to recognize God's mourning, recognize how meek you're to be, how hungry you're to be for God's righteousness, and you get to walk this planet as a person who in your wake, like a boat, leaves peace. When someone comes to visit your home, they say, wow, it feels like I'm out in the country. When someone walks into your office, it's like, the Lord's here. When someone comes into your classroom, it's a blessed space. You get to be a peacemaker. That's what the kingdom people have been authorized to do. And the last thing we see is that if you follow down this line, which is my entire week was an experience of the Beatitudes, the last one will come. It says, finally, you will be someone who is persecuted. In Greek, that means you will be hunted down and pursued and attacked. The population of heaven, this is it. This is going to be the normal thing. Not, like right now, this is abnormal. In the future, this is going to be normal. Only this 100%, this is, this is the type of living in heaven. And what's interesting is Jesus begins this sermon series, this sermon about the kingdom of God. He says, in the kingdom, this is what's normal. This is what it means to be poor in spirit. This is what it means to live in front of my Father's presence. This is what it means to see my Father. This is what it means to hunger for my Father. This is what it means to live in this world. And the last thing you'll see, if you live in this way, you will be persecuted, chewed up and spit out. And Jesus says, rejoice. Don't take this as a bad sign. And even further, instead of, when I get persecuted or hunted down, if, if, I, if someone's after me, we normally lower our head, right? Walk away. If you get on an online Facebook, I mean, my, my dad told me, if you get in a fight, you got one goal, get out of it. Right? Get out of the fight. Well, what Jesus says on the next part of this scripture after all the Beatitudes, this is who the kingdom is, this is what you'll become, this is what happens to you in this world. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You're the light unto the nations, you're a city built on the hill. What Jesus is saying, unlike what the world would say, if you're being persecuted, the world would say, run. Jesus says, if you're being persecuted in my righteousness, let's go public with this. God's kingdom, 
that he is building, that he is delivering, that he's allowing you to walk in right now, includes the church today participating in his eternal reign. And that when we live this way, we are blessing the Father by openly living like a city on a hill. That I mentioned this before, our political volume needs to be down at about a 2, and our Jesus volume needs to be at an 11. We were called by Christ to go public with all this stuff, to not live as huddled communities underground, but to live openly. That when persecution comes, we get even more open. When someone comes and slandered us, we say, no, 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 I'm far worse than you're saying. In fact, if you're going to slander my name, I'm willing to wait until the day of judgment to have my reputation cleared. Instead, my soul focuses on the Father and on His kingdom. The Beatitudes create a person whose whole life is revolved around God's glory, not your place on the internet. Not your, leave a mark on life. No. Let God leave a mark on this world. In your life. Jesus starts this sermon. He goes from zero to ninety. Break yourself, he says. Get small, get broken. Let God move in your life. You will then and then alone be able to walk in my kingdom. And you're supposed to be out there. My church is supposed to be bright and broad because the days are numbered and the Father has given us an eternal mark an eternal calling an eternal way of life that can be lived today let's pray Father in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit we ask a blessing now that your word would find its root into people's hearts that we could experience the smallness of our flesh and the greatness of your spirit in our lives. That you would give us not just an idea, but a true deep hunger to constantly ask, what is the Father doing here? What is he doing now? Lord, move in us in such a way that all of our responses, all of the Christians walking on this earth are done with a pure heart so that we are able to discern who you are and where you are and what you're up to. And may we not flee from the world, but may we shine in it so that the world, that all mankind could see the good deeds of the Spirit in us and give you glory, Father. We pray the rebel's prayer every Sunday, Lord, the traitor's prayer, the prayer that says we want a different kingdom than the one that's here. And whenever we pray the Lord's Prayer, may we recognize that we are participating in a rebellion to the state of this world when we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And would your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That you would provide us ever our, our daily bread, that you would forgive us our sins, that you would keep us safe from ourselves, and that at the same time you would keep us safe from evil. Because we know, we don't think, we don't hope, we know that you, Father, and you alone have eternal kingdom and eternal power and eternal glory forever and ever. Amen.